As Rick said, my name is Andrew Waterman, um, and uh, you see uh, two logos up here besides there's five one. Um, uh, my company sci Five's logo and the uh, UC Berkeley logo, but I, this belies an important point. So, although a lot of the work on the privileged architecture and the ISA in general began at Berkeley and saw it as continued at sci Five, there have been contributions from well over a dozen different entities, and I think last I checked, the privileged spec had something like 33 unique contributors to it. So, um, although uh, Kirsten and I are serving as the editors for the privilege uh, specification, uh, it's a much bigger uh, effort than, than, than we could manage to do ourselves. So, uh, so there's some uh, hot off the press news. Um, when I was on the plane over here uh, from, uh, from California, I pushed out uh, new revisions of the uh, ISA specifications with the user ISA and the uh, privilege spec. I'll briefly talk about the user ISA and then transition over to talking about the privilege spec, which is the bulk of this talk. Um, so most of the changes to the user ISA spec uh, are of the nature of improving the quality of the documentation itself. Um, we, uh, you know, we, we froze the user ISA two years ago, uh, the base ISA and, and, and the four standard extensions, uh, MAF and D. Um, and so you know, we've, been, uh, we've been holding ourselves to that. We did, however, make one important change, which is closing up a specification hole um, in the uh, double precision floating point uh, instruction set. Um, and that is that it was not well defined in the ISA what happened, uh, the way that narrower floating point types were uh, represented in wider floating point registers, or what happened when you used the wrong kind of floating point operation on the wrong kind of operand. Uh, that's not well defined. I'm not going to go into details of it, but suffice it to say that smaller floating point numbers are now represented as NANDs in the wider format. And so uh, operations tend to fail exactly the way you would expect rather than doing something implementation defined. Um, so uh, we also pushed out version 1.10 of the privilege architecture, which is what I'm going to talk about today. Um, the uh, specs uh, are now available uh, open source on GitHub, and the compiled specifications themselves are also in the same repo. Uh, the URL is right here at the uh, GitHub risc organization. Uh, we also uploaded all the uh, previous uh, privilege spec uh, PDFs there as well, so if you're interested in comparing them. But, uh, but we have been doing our best to uh, include in the preface to those documents uh, a list of changes so you can see clearly what changed between 1.10 and the previous version of 1.9.1. .1. Um, one other uh, spec-related detail, uh, we've, uh, we've changed from an authorship model on the specs to an editorship model uh, since there have been so many contributors and uh, Chris and I are largely operating in the role of editors as well as contributors to the spec. So now it's just Chris and me as editors and all of the other 30 some people in alphabetical order uh, as the contributors. So uh, the biggest news uh, in this talk today, aside from the specs being pushed out, is that um, we are uh, declaring the privileged architecture to be more or less stable. Um, I think uh, the more part is that uh, the previous version of spec 1.9.1, uh, we've kept compatibility with that for machine mode only implementation, so there's no backward incompatible changes for people whose processors are simple microcontrollers that only implement machine mode. Um, the, uh, so from this version on, we're also pledging to do our best to uh, do the same for the supervisor ISA. So uh, any implementations uh, made to uh, this standard should comply with software written against future versions of the standard with machine mode and, and supervisor mode. Um, one caveat to this claim, uh, these are still technically proposals for an architecture specification. Uh, the risk five Foundation has to ratify these. Uh, we certainly hope that they go with only minor modifications, but uh, that is, I think, the one uh, they pitch to uh, guarantee compatibility going forward. Um, so uh, a high-level overview of the uh, risk five privilege architecture. Um, so uh, you know, our goal is to provide clean levels between the uh, different layers of the software stack, you know, between the applications, the operating systems, and the uh, uh, the, the low-level software that underpins the operating systems. So uh, most systems are structured abstractly, uh, kind of like this diagram at the top left corner, where you have an application, and it's running on top of some sort of application execution environment, and there's an ABI, an application binary interface, which is a uh, clearly defined interface between the two. So you can swap out the implementation of the app application execution environment, and the same application code can still run. So for example, one, one incarnation of this might be you have uh, a Unix-like operating system that is hosting an application that implements the ABI, 
but you know, it's not. Uh, but, but the OS also has to run on something. So in a traditional model, the OS might run directly on the hardware, uh, and uh, that is possible in RISC V. Uh, the the in that case, the SBI, the supervisor memory interface, which is analogous to the ABI. In that case, the SBI is pretty much in, just implemented bare metal, right? Uh, but there are other uh, implementations possible. For example, you could run uh, operating systems on top of, on top of a hypervisor. The, uh, if the SBI is, uh, is, is well defined, uh, it doesn't actually really matter whether the OS is aware of the fact that it's running on a hypervisor. If you think it's running bare metal, if you know it's being hypervised, it doesn't really matter. Um, so uh, all of the uh, interfaces in the risk v privilege architecture stack are designed to support uh, being fully virtualized all the way down to machine mode. Machine mode itself is not designed to be fully virtualized because it is the actual thing that you're building and it can't be turned all the way down. So uh, in the uh, privilege 1.10 architecture, there are three modes of operation. There's user mode, which is where application code ordinarily runs. There's supervisor mode, which is where a traditional Unix like operating system ordinarily runs. And then there's machine mode, which is uh, the which can serve a number of purposes, like the reptilian brain of the processor that's supporting the operating system to do some uh, to do some very low level tasks. But that's not the only way to use these three privilege modes. Um, in some very low cost systems, you might only implement machine mode. That's the only mode that's required to be implemented. Um, and that's suitable for some simple embedded systems. Uh, and uh, you know, but, but not always. Sometimes you want some protection between like different applications, even in an embedded system, in which case you might also implement user mode so you can separate applications from the trusted code. And finally, uh, you may have a fully page-based virtual memory system or an operating system like Linux, in which case you also implement the supervisor mode. Uh, I've left out here uh, any discussion of hypervisors. Uh, I'll talk about at the end of the talk why that's the case. Um, but for now, let's uh, talk a bit more about those uh, those three uh, those three use cases: simple embedded systems, uh, embedded system for protection, and those running computer like OSs. So, in the first case, an implementation that's supporting a simple embedded uh, simple embedded system only needs to implement machine code. Uh, it has pretty primitive feature set. There's, for example, no address translation. There's either no or very little memory protection. Uh, for example, we strongly recommend that people do things like trap accesses to physical addresses that don't exist. But beyond that, there's 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 not much to prevent uh, errant code from from poking any uh, any memory app address in the system. Uh, so the implicit assumption is that the application code is trusted, or else you would not build a system like this. Now. Uh, I realize that not a lot of there are lots of systems for which this is not at all appropriate. The main reason that we presented as one of the options is because it's very low cost to implement. So there, for an RB32 system uh, that's only running in mode, the cost to implementing machine mode, in addition to what's in the I, user ISA spec, like in addition to the ISA registers and so forth, it's around 100 bits of extra architectural state. So it's reasonably cheap. Um, if you want some basic functionality like timers, then it's another order 100 bits. And if you want some basic performance diagnostic facilities, it's another order 100 bits. So this is reasonably small compared to the size of the image register file. So it's not that onerous to implement machine mode. Um, as I said, that's not sufficient for all kinds of systems. Even in some embedded systems, you want to be able to support multiple processes and have isolation between them and between them and the trusted code on which they're running. Um, and uh, so to do that, you provide user mode. Uh, you run the application code in user mode, the trusted code in machine mode. Uh, you might additionally provide uh, the in ISA extension for user level interrupts. I'm not going to talk too much about that today, but basically it extends the machine and supervisor interrupt scheme down to user mode, so you can take interrupts entirely with the user mode without having to go back through your more, your more privileged code, which can improve performance and simplify software development for some embedded systems. Um, so in a scheme like this where you have machine and user mode, there's still no address translation, but in order for this separating the software by privilege mode to be useful, you need some sort of memory protection mechanism. Otherwise, the user code could just you know, access uh, memory addresses owned by the machine mode, and that would defeat the whole purpose of isolating them. Um, and so uh, we defined a new feature in the uh, 1.10 version of privilege architecture to accommodate this. It's called uh, physical memory protection, or PMP. Um, and it's not a required feature. You don't have to implement it, although there's not much reason to implement user mode unless you do implement it. Um, so uh, when it's implemented, uh, what happens is uh, any memory accesses uh, from, made from user mode are by default 
they by default they have no permissions. So any loader store or even instruction fetch will by default just generate an access exception so you back in the machine mode. So then you configure the physical memory protection unit to grant read, write, or execute permissions on address ranges. We support a very fine granularity all the way down to four bytes. So you can use this thing to, for example, protect certain device registers from user code, but not other nearby device registers. Um, the way it's currently defined in the ISA, we support the 16 uh, regions of physical memory protection. Uh, these regions are, align, are, are either naturally aligned on a power of two number of bytes, anywhere from four bytes up to the total physical memory size capacity of the system. Um, or you can gang two of them together to form a base of balance region, so you can have more uh, flexibility than just using power of two size regions. But that is more costly because it takes up two registers. Um, so one other uh, feature about the PMPs is that they can be locked, which means that once they're programmed, they can't be reprogrammed without doing a full system reset. Uh, and when they're computed in this mode, they also affect the behavior of machine mode physical memory accesses. So this is useful for systems where uh, you might not trust all of the processors in the system and you don't even trust the machine mode code running on them. So when they first boot up, say they're executing out of some system ROM, they can program all the PMDs so that they can only access some parts of memory. And from that point on, you can guarantee that that core will never be able to touch certain addresses in the memory in the address map even if it's running it in the most trusted privilege mode. Um, so uh, we, uh, I, I said that there are three, three broad, broad classes of application uh, that we're going to support. We're going to support simple embedded systems, embedded systems with protection, and uh, traditional units like OSs um, with page-based virtual memory. So if that's what you want, you provide S mode in addition to MMU. Um, so S mode provides a uh, fairly vanilla uh, page-based virtual memory system uh, in both 32-bit and 64-bit RISC-V uh, memories divided into 4K pages. Uh, we use a uh, fairly standard radix tree uh, based page table um, where in every 32 there are two page table levels. Each page table level is mapping 10 bits of the address and the, the, uh, the 4K page, uh, base page provides 12 bits so you get to 32 that way. Um, it looks a lot like the scheme used in x86 and several other 32-bit ISAs. Uh, the the um, RB64 scheme is similar, uh, to, uh, you know, 12 bits of page offset and 9 bits of translation provided per, per page level. So you use three or four page table levels to get to 39 or 48 uh, virtual address bits. We think that'll be sufficient for uh, a lot of systems for a very long time. However, some very large servers with you know with, with you know, petabytes and more of uh, of, of, uh, of, of memory are going to uh, need um, substantially more virtual address space than that. We reserve the encoding space in the ISA to add more levels to the page table. Um, this scheme ex extends pretty naturally to a uh, 57 or 64 bit virtual address size, but we haven't uh, frozen the definition of those yet because we want to experiment with a couple um, techniques to reduce the cost of locking page tables. Uh, once you're at that point that you're talking about like six or seven serialized memory accesses to get a translation, uh, so TLD has become uh, quite painful. And we have some ideas to support skimming parts of the address map that are, uh, the parts of the page table map that are sparse to uh, accelerate that in a common case. Um, so uh, super pages are possible at any level in this hierarchy. So you get four mega super pages in, in RB32 and two mega super pages, one mega super pages, and so forth in RB64. Um, and the ISA is spec around the notion that uh, that the page table walks with foreign hardware. So in other words, TLD misses don't cause exceptions as they do in some architectures. Uh, that's the abstraction that the supervisor level ISA sees. We realize not everyone actually wants to implement uh, hardware page data walking, even though it is a good choice for performance. And so, you know, you can fall back to machine mode to emulate this effect of supervisor, where a machine mode trap handler refills the software TLD. This would be a non-standard extension of the ISA, but it would still allow you to run the same operating system code without providing hardware page data walk. So. Uh, I just described two different uh, memory protection mechanisms. Uh, you might be wondering if they uh, can coexist, and the answer is yes. Uh, you can use both physical memory protection and virtual memory. Um, the way this works is that uh, when you access a virtual address, the first thing that happens is that there's a tr an address translation from virtual to physical addresses. That may generate a page fault in the virtual memory sense uh, of, the, uh, of the word. After you perform the address translation, then you go check the resulting physical address with the physical memory protection unit, which itself may generate an access violation. 
So he's composed cleanly. Um, so this is particularly useful when uh, you're, you don't trust the SVO code, but, but you might not actually have a full on hypervisor support, so you want to isolate the OS to some extent. Uh, but um, it's also used for compassion bugs as well. Uh, so a bit more about virtual memory. Um, so this is a, an RB32 page table entry. Um, uh, it supports uh, controlling independently the read, write, and execute permissions on a page. So this supports execute only pages, which was a much requested feature from uh, 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 from, from people in the RISC-V community, particularly on the security side of things. Uh, the only combinations that are illegal are the ones that specify write permissions without read permissions, because in most contexts that doesn't actually make any sense. So we reserve those for future use. Um, so one feature that's a bit different about the RISC-V uh, page table entries than some of our architectures is that by default, uh, the permissions do not increase as you go up the privilege stack. So supervisor isn't allowed by default to access user pages. The main reason for this is that it's useful for finding bugs in device drivers and in some uh, low-level kernel code, uh, but it is definitely a security advantage. Um, there's also a goal that which allows you to accelerate the performance of, uh, of operating system translations. Mike will talk about that now. Um, and uh, one thing that's changed in this version of the virtual memory system is the way that we manage uh, that we manage accessing dirty bits. Uh, so these are the bits that indicate whether the page has been read or written since the last time those were cleared. Um, they're used for a number of things, but, but, but swapping is the most obvious example. Uh, so previously, uh, we said that, there, that updates to those bits were performed in hardware. It didn't say much more than that. Uh, it turns out that that is actually a significant anti feature unless those uh, unless those updates to the access and dirty bits are atomic with respect to the permissions checks on the page table entries itself. So that's a bit of a subtle point. Uh, what I need to say is, if the hardware were to go read the page table entry and see that the, that the access has permissions, and then not atomically go set the access for dirty bit, then the, then another access to the page table entry could have intervened, and uh, that can wreak havoc on paging code in particular. Uh, so what we ended up doing is mandating the checks be atomic, but because that's a pain to implement in lots of implementations, also provide the option of just not doing it at all. So you generate an exception if the appropriate access to dirty bit is not set, and let the operating system decide what to do. Uh, so uh, as I mentioned, by default, uh, supervisor can't access user memory, but sometimes it needs to because, for example, if you do a system call, you pass some arguments to the operating system via memory, the OS wants to go read them. So we added a bit to uh, the S status registers to enable it disregards the, uh, the U bit so that uh, S mode can uh, read user pages. Uh, similarly, uh, execute only pages are nice, but they create a bit of a headache if you want to support things like illegal instruction emulation. So we added another bit to the S dash register, which when set allows execute only pages to be read. Uh, and uh, finally, uh, we added a uh, feature to allow the operating system to choose what virtual memory mode it's, on, it's operating in. This is a uh, this was admittedly a bit of an omission on our part. In the previous versions of the architecture, we relied on machine mode to program the virtual memory mode the operating system would run in, and the OS would just always run in that mode. Uh, some operating systems or writers requested of us that they be able to control whether the OS has address the translation turned on or off, or how many levels of the page table there are, so we expose that to the OS. Uh, there's still a mechanism to track accesses to those things, so that, uh, for example, a, uh, um, a classical uh, Hypervisor running the machine mode can intercept OS accesses to these uh, uh, fields so that they can uh, create, so they can maintain shadow page tables. Um, so I'll talk very briefly about uh, interrupts in risk five. I was going to go into more depth, but I think that that will push us uh, uh, about 15 minutes past the uh, the, uh, the end of the schedule of the end of this talk. Um, so uh, I guess I'll briefly mention that. Uh, that, interrupts in, that designing a single interrupt scheme for risk five is a bit of a challenge because different systems have vastly different needs for uh, interrupt handling in much the same way that different systems have vastly different needs for memory translation and protection. And uh, so we want to you know, define one template for all of this while supporting a few different kinds of systems. Um, one important class is high performance uh, systems running near like operating systems. These are the kinds of systems that don't actually spend that much of their time usually handling interrupts, uh, because partially because the uh, you know fat out of superscalar cores they're running on are slow state interrupts, so people, so systems coders do their best to avoid them. The second is that more and more work that was traditionally done by interrupt handlers is being pushed into uh, into the devices themselves, reducing the total number of interrupts. Um, so. Uh, 
so these systems don't actually spend that much time handling interrupts. They just want them to work. Um, uh, embedded systems, the story is very different. Uh, a lot of the times, you know, your your uh, embedded applications spend the majority of their time in interrupt handlers, uh, effectively using the interrupt uh, the interrupt mechanism as a scheduler. So they're not really actually running. At, they're, not, they're not often running applications code uh, waiting for interrupts. They're just always servicing interrupts. So in that case, the latency of the interrupts is pretty important. Uh, likewise, real-time systems are kind of on the other end of the spectrum, where because of the non-determinism and overhead of taking interrupts, they just don't want to take interrupts at all, and instead they use polling. So, design, so defining one scheme that, that suits all of these is, 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 is pretty challenging. We think we have something that, that does acceptably in all cases. Um, we've uh, divided the, the, the classes of interrupts in this five into local and global. Local interrupts are things like software and tire interrupts. Uh, global interrupts are those kind of external devices. And uh, they're all exposed to the uh, uh, to machine mode via one register that contains uh, a bit for each of the possible interrupts. Uh, it's also possible to add your own uh, implementation defined interrupts, which is great if you have some need for a low latency interrupt that goes directly to the processor. You want to bypass the global interrupt, the, the platform level interrupt controller, and so forth. Um, I'm going to uh, not talk about the details of the uh, time and software interrupts. Uh, but instead, uh, skip briefly to talking about uh, the way that external interrupts work in a risk kind of platform. I'd say platform here rather than architecture because this is something that will change from system to system. Um, so uh, in that uh, list of, uh, of registers, uh, you see there's a, uh, how does this work? There's uh, some external interrupt bits here. These are bits that are coming directly from a platform level interrupt controller. Um, each uh, privilege mode in a RISC-V system has its own external interrupt bit. So you can have different uh, external interrupts that are always around the machine mode from different external interrupts that are always around the supervisor mode. And if you implement the uh, extension for user mode interrupts, uh, you will also have uh, the option of taking interrupts directly from external devices into user mode. Um, we accomplished uh, that through a level of interaction. Uh, there is a platform level interrupt controller, which is effectively an interrupt crossbar. All the interrupt sources come in, and then wires go out to, to all of the cores. And uh, then, um, and, and the, the particular programming device that has things like uh, customizable priorities, uh, you know, curve heart maintenance, and so forth. Uh, so you can choose how to route interrupts and choose what priority your interrupts have. Um, and uh, there is a way of enabling and disabling all of the interrupts. Um, the, the, uh, the, there's per interrupt masks, and there's also a global interrupt enabled bit for each of the privilege levels. The model here is that uh, when you are running a high privilege mode, let's say you're in machine mode, you will never ever take an interrupt into supervisor or user mode, no matter what their interrupt settings are. Uh, conversely, if you're running in user mode, machine mode interrupts are always turned on uh, no matter what. You can't, like, so in other words, you can't have this priority inversion, inversion where uh, in user mode, you uh, you disable interrupts and then you can't track back into a higher level. So the enable bits are only interested when that's the mode that you're currently running in. That allows you to locally, uh, or to turn off interrupts for your current uh, uh, privilege mode. So you can have the appearance of atlas, you can things like device driver interactions. Um, so by default, all of these interrupts go directly to machine mode. Uh, you know, you skip the possibility of going from into directly into user mode or, or into supervisor mode. Um, and machine mode software can then decide what to do um, you can always uh, implement things like horizontal traps with this. You uh, uh, write some, you, you reprogram some machine mode CSRs and, and execute an in rent, which is the return from machine mode exception handler instruction, and send you where you actually want to go. The problem with this is that it's not especially high performance because you end up having more privilege level transitions every time you take an interrupt. So we also define a mechanism to delegate interrupts to lower privilege modes. So there, there's uh, a, a, a machine interrupt delegation register that has the same layout as those other interrupt related registers. We instead of in that register, it means that the interrupt becomes owned by the next less privileged node. Um, so in a system with, uh, with machine supervisor user modes, that means that the interrupt not, is not owned by the supervisor. Uh, and, uh, the, and when an interrupt occurs in either user or supervisor mode for that interrupt, it will go directly into the supervisor mode's trap handler, skipping machine mode. So I said uh, towards the beginning of the talk that I uh, talked about why hypervisors did not show up in the three privilege level stack. So if you read one of the previous versions of the spec, you would have seen that there were actually four privilege modes. There's hypervisor mode living between machine and supervisor modes. Um, 
and uh, feedback from the community led us to backtrack on that design. So that, uh, that design was based around support for type one hypervisors, where you have a dedicated virtual machine monitor and an OS is running on top of them. Um, it's uh, great for that purpose, however, it is not so great for type two hypervisors like KVM, where an operating system is acting both as a virtual machine monitor and as a traditional OS, uh, because it incurs an extra set of context switches every time you want to do a VM world switch. Uh, so with uh, what are some fairly minor changes to the hardware implementation, but significant changes to the specification, uh, we will, uh, you know, have a we will have a, a, a hypervisor ISA that caters to uh, those demands as well, um, and uh, we anticipate have a spec for that release uh, by the end of the summer. Or so, uh, so and and we'll be plenty of time to get feedback on that. Um, I should comment that uh, even though the ISA is not going to be designed around support for type two hypervisors, support for type one hypervisors is still fine. Uh, you know, if you manage to do a mapping to either of these ISAs, you'll see that it works out okay. Um, so as to the uh, status of the implementation of these things, um, you know, we only just released the spec uh, a day ago, but in parallel with that, we've also been working on our software and hardware implementations. Uh, so Spike, our ISA simulator, and uh, UC Berkeley's rocket ship both conform to the 1.10 privilege architecture already. Uh, we have a Linux port for the 1.10 privilege architecture that works with Spike and Rocket, and we're in, right now we're in the process of upstreaming that. So we're hoping that we can send an initial patch set to the Linux kernel mailing list uh, by the uh, end of May, and uh, you know, uh, inshallah we'll have a Linux upstream uh, by the end of the summer. Um, uh, also, the, uh, the upstream ports of the GCC and VIN utils um, are compatible with the new privilege architecture. So, uh, that's about the end of my status update. I think we probably have a few minutes for questions, right, Rick? Dave? What feedback did you get? Did you get feedback from the security working group? And what changes did you make respect as a result? Um, so, uh, adding some form of physical memory protection was in response to that demand. Uh, I think uh, a lot of the changes in the privilege architecture spec have been made in response to security researchers on the mailing lists, but none of the changes that I've personally made in the spec are, are in response to the uh, security task group. Uh, Krista might have uh, a comment for country. Yeah, just one thing to say is that in PMPs, we previously had those be platforms specific. They've been around for a long time, but we never laid out a spec. People wanted an actual spec. That was partly the security research group wanted to have there. So we put an actual spec in there, which, um, yeah, and that's what's in the PMP specs. PMPs have been around a long time. This is an actual kind of design for them. Dan Lustig from NVIDIA. I just had one uh, clarification question. That you mentioned a few times about uh, Unix-like OSs. I was just curious if that was uh, somehow meant to ex uh, exclude certain things, or if that was just because you focused on those most. Uh, right. So uh, I guess that, that term probably deserved being defined. What I mean is uh, operating systems that make use of the traditional process abstraction and rely on virtual memory to implement it. So I'd include in that things like Windows. Um, the uh, uh, things that are not included there are our tosses that do not uh, rely on virtual memory. Those are probably best implemented with the machine and music combination. Uh, did you have something in particular in mind you were wondering about? Okay. Uh, I'm from Georgia University. I have a question about the document uh, about chapter 9 one, uh, about SBI function. Uh, in, in this chapter, I see you just uh, described the function and uh, there is no implementation. And uh, I found that in, in Linux implementation, there is just a uh, uh, core definition. So where are the implementation? And uh, my question is uh, the implementation of this SPI function is, uh, sh should, uh, is recommended to by the vendors or by the risk five 
foundations. Right. So uh, the question is about the supervisor binary interfaces uh, and who is responsible for providing the, implement the underlying implementations. So first of all, I should add the comment that the uh, we've uh, removed temporarily the SBI specification from the privileged ISA version 1.2 manual because it is out of date and we will be separately releasing a um, SBI spec. Kind of like how the ABI spec doesn't belong in the user ISA, we think that the SBI spec should be a separate thing from the privileged architecture spec. As to the implementations of it and who provides them, that will depend. The foundation, and well, the, so there should be open source implementations of the SBI. There currently is one. There's this, uh, there's this thing called the Berkeley bootloader, which is what we prototype Linux on top of. That's an implementation of the SBI. Other systems will provide, will have vendor provided SBI implementations. If, for example, they use a non-standard uh, machine implementation underneath S mode. So I think the answer is both. I'm a student from ICT, and I noticed that uh, this new version added the, the physical memory protection uh, uh, protection. So uh, my question is: Is it still a concept uh, in the spec specification, or is it uh, supported in the CISO codes? Uh, yes. Yeah, so uh, it is. Implement, the physical memory protection scheme is indeed implemented in the UC Berkeley rocket ship implementation in CISO code. Uh, I'm not at this moment aware of other hardware implementations that have implemented the PEP scheme. Thank you very much. Um, as, uh, for now, uh, we know that all the implementation of this craft is based on Chisel. And uh, uh, from uh, my observation, this uh, workshop is focused on uh, risk file. And uh, my question is about Chisel. Uh, are you going to release all your uh, designs in Chisel and uh, what the a relationship between Chiso and the risk five. So is the you in that sentence like me and Sci Five or uh, so uh, Sci Five fully intends to continue developing its processor course in Chisel. Other than that, there's not a formal relationship between Chisel and Risk Five, except for the fact that they were created in the same research group at the same university, and so people who like Risk Five also tend to like Chisel who are from Berkeley. Uh, I would encourage people to use Chisel, but I certainly think that there should be implementations of the RISC-V ISA in other hardware description languages like Vero, like and VHDL, and I know there are. I think that would be helpful for education because there is a steep learning curve to Chisel, but uh, we, fully, we intend uh, to continue using it.